As you mentioned, I'm, I'm Johnny Lenny. I work at LifeRay. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been across multiple departments from engineering to developer relations to uh, product management to security uh, and now in operations. One of my last projects uh, on the security team was to build out the information security program for the LifeRay Cloud team and the DXP Cloud product. During this time, we became certified in ISO 27001 and SOC 2. And so today, I want to share some of our experience going from not zero, but uh, near zero to uh, achieving these certifications and building out a, uh, a good information security program. Before we go deep at all, uh, I first want to kind of ask the question of why should we care about security? We have a lot of priorities on our plate. I'm sure even now during this conference, there's a lot of things filling our heads uh, from, from work. We have uh, ever-changing technologies that we need to keep up with and evolve to. We have a shifting uh, market that we need to please. We have competitors coming up uh, behind us trying to pass. And we even have interpersonal and, and drama inside our own teams, inside our company and politics we're trying to manage. And amongst all of these priorities, we kind of feel lost. And sometimes it's hard to know what we should focus on. And should security really be the thing we do focus on? Is that really the highest priority with all these other priorities uh, that we're faced with? And if so, why? A lot of times security is kind of a, a silent player, kind of in the background. We only really hear about it when something goes wrong. This is a study from IBM. Uh, they found that in 2018, so last year, there was 6,515 publicly disclosed data compromising events in 2018, not to consider the ones that weren't publicly disclosed, exposing almost 5 billion sensitive records. That's almost enough to expose a, a personal record from everyone that, that lives in the world. Let's look at just a couple of the, the top 10 breaches of all time. I'm sure many of these you've heard of, companies you've seen, Yahoo, the biggest one, 3 billion uh, records lost in 2013. First American Bank, Facebook, Yahoo again the year later, uh, the Marriott uh, Hotels, Friend Finder, MySpace, Equifax, Capital One, and Heartland. All of these with millions and even billions of personal records that were lost in the breach. But how much did these uh, cost for the companies? Equifax, for example, reported losing $1.4 billion in the course of, of the next, you know, say, five years of their incident, mostly from lost business due to the lack of trust in their, in their brand and in their company after the data breach. Now, hold on, I know what you're thinking. I don't work at Equifax. I may not be in a, um, a global company or a, a company that has such reach and huge user bases where this would affect me like this. And you're, you're, you're right, but are you sure that it won't affect you in a great way? Again, from the same study from IBM, they saw over the past five years a 12% increase in costs, overall costs from incidents, and it's continuing to rise. On average, across the globe, there was over, sorry, there was, uh, on average, 25,000 records lost in each uh, data breach incident, with an average cost of about $150 per record. That brings the average total to $4 million on average uh, for an incident like a data breach. $4 million. Are you sure that you're exempt? And this number is just the global average across all companies. In certain industries, like healthcare or financial, this number can be almost double. Even in certain countries, depending on where you're located, the, the number can go up uh, exponentially. And this is also interesting. 
if we look, this is a graph of uh, the cost of the incidents depending on the company size. So on the left, we have about 500 or less employees. On the right, we have 25,000. And it makes sense. OK, the bigger the company, the more they have to lose, the more expensive the data breach is. It makes sense. What's scary is when we start to compare that as a cost per employee, which is an indicator of the impact cost on the organization. When you look at this, it's exponentially more expensive for the smaller companies, which means there's even more risk involved for a data breach the smaller your company is. There's actually a 27% chance that your organization will be, uh, undergo a, a data breach of some kind in the next two years. As you look around to your left and right, if you hug two people, that's one of you is probably going to be involved in a, in a data breach. Are you ready for that? And these aren't, you know, I'm not making these numbers up. This is, this is a study that's been going on for 10, 15 years from IBM, uh, from hundreds of thousands of companies all around the world. So really the question is not why should we care about security or if we should care about security, but what are we doing to prevent these kinds of things? And this actually introduces a, a dilemma. If you're taking it seriously, you might think, OK, I have my infrastructure, I have my servers, I have my internal systems. We need to lock everything down immediately. There's a storm coming. There's natural disasters. There's malicious attacks. There's hackers. And we just need to hide under a rock and wait for the storm to pass. The problem is, that strategy will completely stop innovation. If you're waiting and not wanting to change anything to introduce a risk, then you're not going to uh, move on to the next, uh, the next innovation that your company needs to, to stay alive. We have a lot of examples of companies that didn't innovate. This is a, a Xerox printer. Xerox actually invented one of the first uh, personal computers, but they had this steady uh, revenue generating products with the facts and the printers. And they really just didn't see the potential in personal computers. So they just stuck to what they knew. And then now they're not even a player in the personal computing industry. We also have companies like uh, Kodak. Sorry, the clicker. We have companies like Kodak that were a huge leader in the film camera industry. And they invented one of the first digital cameras. But their engineering efforts were halted by the business team because they didn't want to um, compromise their film camera sales. And then companies like uh, Nikon, Canon, Sony, they came in and completely took over the market. We also have Blockbuster. I don't know how common they were here, but in the US, you could see blockbusters in every city across the nation. And as the internet started growing, they didn't see the potential there. They wanted to invest more into their brick and mortar stores. But then streaming services came along and completely annihilated them. There's only, I think, one open today. So you don't want to be at like these companies and not innovating, right? So that's really the dilemma. How do we innovate without introducing extra security risks? And I think this is where the holistic portion of our information security programs come in to balance that dilemma. So I want to give you five goals that you could take to your own organization to help promote a, a security-centered uh, culture at your, at your organization. The first one is to share responsibility. Now, people are at the core of our organizations. Without people, you don't have an engineering team, you don't have a sales force, you don't have a leadership team, you don't have anything. Your, your organization fails to exist without people. They're really the, the heartbeat of uh, your organization's existence. And they're, they're really your biggest asset. And it's not just the internal people, it's also external. Sorry. Uh, it's also the external, like partners and contractors and vendors and community and user base. Those are all go into the ecosystem that creates your organization. And although they're your biggest asset, 
they're also your biggest risk. Let's just take a, a, a theoretical for here. We have a, a business analyst that works at a financial uh, bank, let's say Acme Bank. Now at this bank, there's a, a customer portal that they use. And he noticed that um, there was a, a database in, in the customer portal that was not encrypted. This is a, a huge risk. This can't happen. So he thinks, OK, how could I solve this? So he goes to, he has a friend in engineering. And he knows that engineers can pretty much do anything. So he goes to the engineer and says, hey, we have this unencrypted database. Can you help with that? Can you, do, can you encrypt that for me? And the engineer says, well, yes, I technically can, but I have all these other priorities. I can't just start creating my own sprints. I don't know if I can maintain this. And so I, I can't just you know, do this for you. And so the business analyst says, OK, how can, I, how can I keep moving? I don't want this to stop me. So he decides, what if I kind of bring awareness to this problem? And he, and he uh, schedules a talk in his, in his office and starts talking about security, how encryption is important. He shows the gap here in this, in this customer portal that it should be encrypted. And, and they agree with him. They think this is, this is very important. But at the end of the day, they, they still aren't uh, the decision makers here. Um, they still aren't the ones that can allocate resources to this effort. They aren't the ones that can... can um, create a budget for this. So he decides next he needs to go all the way to the top. And he, he sees the CEO in the hallway and he, he grabs him into a room and he says, hey, can I talk to you about something really important? And he's able to convince the CEO that this is a, an initiative worth working on. It's a problem worth fixing. And thanks to that, they create an initiative around, you know, they, they, they throw in a sprint in the, in the backlog and they, and they fix this vulnerability. But we all know that's not the end, right? That was one issue that he fixed. And this is a continuing process. They're going to find more problems, more vulnerabilities, and they're going to need to keep uh, improving the security at their company. So the fact that he was able to impact so many people in the organization, now they have a network and uh, a collaboration around this. So in the future, it will be easy to do this kind of changes. And it's not just, uh, again, inside your organization, but also outside. Uh, the Acme Bank has a lot of different systems, a lot of uh, different uh, things they're working on. And there's kind of a fundamental question when they start building something new is should we put it in the cloud or should we put it on-premise? And in their analysis, I mean, there's a lot of perceived value to on-premise. There's a, there's a sense of control and they can build this kind of fortress where it's their facility, it's their people managing, it's their ecosystem. And that feels safe. And sometimes it, it, it is. But they have to consider all the factors. Not even thinking of hackers and malicious attacks, you have all of the, um, the natural disasters to think about. You have hurricanes and floods and fires and anything you can think of that could uh, compromise your data center. So we have to start building out all these security measures for that. They have a surveillance system, they have biometric locks, they have a security patrol team. And at any point, if these things fail, then they're in a lot of trouble. And this is really where cloud can be a huge advantage. Because these cloud providers, they're implementing state-of-the-art security measures to handle these things. And you can leverage those for your own organization instead of having to maintain it all yourself. And it doesn't need to be all cloud. You can do a hybrid approach. Some systems would be ideal in that scenario, and some would be ideal on-premise. And you can uh, bridge a gap between those. Really, at the end of the day, it's just a matter of not taking on all responsibility and maintaining everything yourself, <clears throat> but rather sharing that with experts both in and outside your organization. The second goal is to humanize security controls. When we think about the three main uh, reasons, root causes for data breaches, we have malicious attacks, human error, and system glitches. And this is about, a, from the same study from IBM, this is about the distribution uh, of those three factors. But those can really be broken down into two. One is indirect things that you have control of and the things that you have direct control of. 
And the things that you have direct control of is really the human error, right? That's inside of your organization. And that's what I think we should focus on first. So when we, when we consider the human aspect of these things, humans are good at a lot of things, but they're also, they're bad at a lot of things. One example of something humans are really good at is problem solving. Imagine how long it's taking uh, our, us to create autonomous cars. It's taking years and years and years to actually factor in all the details and decision making that goes into safe driving. Whereas a human can learn it in a matter of months. We're hardwired to be able to problem solve on the fly to take on new scenarios. But something we're bad at is our memory. We've all had that uh, scenario where we're talking with friends or family and someone starts sharing a story. And then halfway through, you jump in and say, that's not how it went. It went like this. And then you start talking and someone else says, no, it actually went like this. And our, our memories are pretty corrupt, actually. Um, there's not too many absolutes as time goes on. But for computers, it's very different. For computers, the way their, um, the, the database is, is, is structured, there's a permanency to, um, to data. So going back to our, our story at, at Acme, um, when the business analyst was going through and talking to the engineer, he noticed that as he was logging into the, the source code uh, repository, he used a password that was only five characters. And he asked the engineer about this, and the engineer says, you know, I have dozens of systems I need to log into. It takes too much time to remember unique passwords for each one. I just simplified it and made it a little bit shorter. It was just too inefficient. And this was interesting. The business analyst didn't get mad, although it was a bad practice, but it was interesting to him because he knew there was a password policy. So if there's a password policy that dictates everything that a password needs to be, why was it so hard for the engineer to follow? Or why was the engineer not motivated to follow the policy? And so he thought, what if we got a password manager? Something where the engineer could remember one password that would unlock the rest of his passwords. And that would allow him to not have to remember since he's, not, uh, he's better at problem solving than remembering. We use the system to remember and we, use, we focus his energy on what he's best at. Another approach would be to work with the system admins to put a technical control in place, a mandatory strong password so that even if the motivation is there, there's a, uh, a, a forced tunnel where he needs to put in a strong password. So that's humanizing controls, engaging the human aspect um, of those controls. The third area is, uh, the third goal is to integrate pr prevention. And we know peripherals are forgettable. Anything outside the normal center operating procedure is prone to be forgotten. The SDLC is a, uh, a likely candidate for this, right? We have the whole process from planning to testing to code, you've seen this before, release, monitor, operate, and back and forth again, right? Oftentimes, we put security on the outside. We think, okay, this is our standard process, and in this scenario, we might inject a security control. We might test specifically for a major release, not a patch release. We might put um, extra QA here and not here. We might, you know, fill in the blank. But the problem is that it's easy to forget about that, especially in a crunch moment where you don't have time. So our business analyst had a, had a scenario where this was, this was in place. Uh, the, the company was working on a new application. They had kind of a, a SWAT engineering team working on this, pumping it out really quickly. And it was, a, it was a beautiful application. It was going to solve a lot of problems. It was going to uh, solve real business needs. It was going to solve problems for the customers. It was going to be awesome. After about six months, uh, they started kind of the UAT phase. And that's when the business analyst got access to it. And he started looking. And he started asking questions like, you know, how, how are we encrypting this application? Where are we hosting it? What kind of connections are coming in and out? What kind of privacy controls do we have? Do we have firewalls in place? Do we have access controls in place? And he found that there was actually a lot of gaps in this application. And it was really prone 
to risks and, and attacks. But he was in a dilemma at this point. He could either enforce the fixes that he knew should happen, or he could turn a blind eye and uh, release with security holes. Neither one are good options. If he enforced the fixes, he would create a bunch of enemies. He would delay the project, it would go up the ranks, it would go to the managers and executives. They would complain, why is the project behind? Oh, we had these surprises, it came from this guy. He would get in trouble, it would be a mess. But if he went the other way, if he turned a blind eye and let them release, he's knowingly exposing it uh, with a, many vulnerabilities. So it's kind of an a impossible situation. Ideally, they would integrate security further left or earlier on in the, in the development cycle. So even from the planning phase, they're thinking with a security mindset. They're starting to plan the security features that have to be in place before it can be sent to production. And that means that it, it becomes a... Uh, it, it puts security all around the process and integrated into the entire process. So that's integrating security, just putting it in, inside of the, the main processes and procedures that we have instead of creating detours and putting it on the peripheral. The next goal is to automate processes. I don't think I need to convince you that automation brings value, right? Whatever team we're on inside of the organization, automation is critical to uh, getting our jobs done, to speeding it up, to being able to accomplish more with our time. Because automation brings action, especially when it's put in the right place and at the right time. There's some good examples of ways to integrate automation into your security um, controls. One is alerting. Now, you could assign someone to watch all the servers and all the metrics at all times, and he would be waiting for the moment where you're running out of CPU or running out of memory. But that would kind of be a waste of time, potentially, right? Or you could just configure an alerting system to let you know at certain thresholds, I need to know that this is reaching a, uh, you know, an unhealthy or uh, a dangerous place, and then I'll, ha I'll notify my engineers and we'll start looking at it. Another, another area is documentation management. There's this thing in information security called the information security management system. It's a lot of long words. It just means all the management of the policies and procedures and, and audit processes for your information security program. If you're involved in this at all, uh, streamlining and automating this process is critical. There's tons of evidence you need to gather, there's documents you need to create, so as much as you can uh, automate those uh, screenshots for evidence, create templates for documents, anything you can do would um, increase uh, what you can accomplish with that team. Because in the end, automation is cost saving, right? It's something that uh, paid hours don't need to do, that humans don't need to do, and so that's our goal. The last goal of um, a holistic information security program is to focus on real business needs. We all have to ask, what's the ROI, right? If we're not bringing a return for the investment, if we're not uh, delivering value, then um, what are we doing here, right? And that's the same for security. Security needs to be bringing value. If we think about uh, how our business analysts convinced the CEO that they should invest in encryption, how do you think he did that? Now, he, you could go with the scare tactic and just show all the, the concerns and all of the dangers, all the threats out there. And that's actually what I used earlier uh, in this talk. And I mean, that's effective, right? It's scary. There is, a, we need to take that seriously. But there's also a lot of uh, good things, a lot of benefits that come from a good security program. One of those is increasing sales opportunities. Most of, uh, most of our customers and opportunities will have a baseline requirements for their security program. And if we don't comply with that as the vendor, they won't even consider us. And if we have a good security program that is well documented, it helps the sales team to give the resources needed to our prospects and customers uh, to convince them that we're a good vendor. 
We also have uh, competition, right? And, and it's coming up, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a rat race to get to the same customers. And if we're falling behind in, in our security programs, that's a way for them to get ahead. And if we are ahead, that's a way for us to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the competition. We also can't underestimate the emotional response to security, especially if you're in a, uh, a customer center, like a, like a B2C if you're in commerce. Um, the way your users and your customers feel is very important. And a good security program can help those customers and those users to feel safe and confident with you as a company, with your solution and your products. And just enhancing customer experience overall. Uh, with less downtimes, no data breaches, all of that, we improve the customer satisfaction. And now we need to prioritize. I would suggest you always start with one. It's easy to get overwhelmed. There's lots of things we could improve. But starting one by one, you can accomplish and then move on to the next thing. For example, if your goal is to increase sales opportunities, maybe you want to focus on these certifications. These are great ways to uh, have a kind of a guiding light to uh, building out your security program. And it's an easy way for your sales team to use certifications um, that are well respected in the industry rather than having to go deep into every security measure that you have to make sure it's compliant with their standards. You could also focus on making uh, your users and, and customers feel safe and confident. Uh, one way to do this is to focus on your documentation. So this is an example. These are 16 policies. Uh, at LifeRate Cloud, we have, this is based on, on, on our policy, so we have these and then many more, but this is kind of the core. Um, all of these, by documenting these uh, policies and procedures and processes, um, it helps not only to have consistency inside of your organization as people come and go, you can um, keep moving because it's all documented, but also you can use that documentation um, for public use, for for your users and your customers to understand how, your, how the internal system works, how your security program works. And in the end, your security program needs to reflect your company. It needs to carry the needs that you have, the priorities that you have, and your timeline. There's a lot of pressure to be dealing with everything immediately, right? The tyranny of the urgent. But in, in reality, you know that you have a certain bandwidth and you know that you have certain priorities. So focus on those first. Don't get distracted with what else is going on and just focus on what's going to bring the most impact to your organization. So that's focusing on real business needs. Just to summarize, I want to go back to Equifax. $1.4 billion lost in their incident. $1.4 billion that could have gone to investing in the future of the company that was lost just paying for this failure. And in the end, it was preventable. This is a quote from um, the US House of Representatives Committee that, um, that did the audit for the Equifax breach. They said Equifax failed to implement an adequate security program to protect, to protect the sensitive data as a result, they allowed one of the largest data breaches in U.S. history. Such a breach was entirely preventable. And I'm here today to say that it wasn't just preventable for Equifax. It's always preventable. So what are you doing to help your company not be the next subject of a data breach? Again, thinking of these goals, sharing responsibility, humanizing controls, integrating into the processes, automating tasks, and focusing on real business needs. And in the end, security can kind of get you down. So don't forget to celebrate the things that your organization is doing, the successes you do have, and build that collaboration in your team. Thank you so much.